العالمين وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا عليكم أنفسكم Recite aloud salawat Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to start with a true story. It is a story about a Muslim scholar who is known as Mullah Sadra. He was an Iranian scholar. He was a philosopher, he was also a mufassir, and he was skilled in many different types of Islamic sciences. And he was also a Gnostic. When he was a young man, he became very interested in the universe and the question related to the existence. He was from Shiraz. He was born and brought up there and initially studied religion in Shiraz and then moved to Isfahan. Isfahan was the capital of Iran at that time and the king was Shah Abbas Safavi. And also the main Hausa was in Isfahan at that time. So Mullah Sadra started to study Islam in Isfahan and he was a very intelligent man, so he started to think outside the box. And he also had his own ideas and views, which did not necessarily match with the traditional views. So the traditionalist mullahs did not really appreciate what he thought and what he propagated. So they started to say, that this young man is a heretic. He is not a Muslim. His views are not like ours. And he says strange things. And eventually they went to the king, Abbas Safawi, and said you should do something about him. The king said, what can I do? You guys should have a debate and let's see who wins. So they said, okay, we are going to organize a debate. They organized the debate and, and invited many big scholars, the traditional scholars, to debate with Mullah Sadra alone. The debate took place and Mullah Sadra won it. Isfahan was a small city. Everybody got to know that Mullah Sadra won the debate. Also his wife. So when he got home, his wife was very happy and greeted him with enthusiasm and said, Congratulations, you have won the debate. But Mullah Sadra looked very sad. She said, You look sad and morose. What's the matter with you? He said, you know, when I was sitting there debating with those scholars and presenting my points of view and giving logical arguments and reasonings, not even for a second did I remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, that day was an important day in Mullah Sadra's life because that day he started to know his true self. 
the question is do i know my true self and do you know your true self know your true self is the topic of this lecture and that is why i recited a part of verse number 105 of surah al-maida in which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says O oh, those who believe it is obligatory upon yourselves to be concerned with your nafs to be concerned with yourself and there are many interpretations of this verse and one of the interpretations is that it is obligatory upon every believer to know his or her true self so what i'm going to do in the next 40 or so minutes is the following what does the quran say about knowing our true self and what does the hadith say about it and then what is the process of knowing our true self and in the end in the last part of the lecture i'll give the examples a few examples from the history some individuals who did not try to know their true self and an individual who was willing to know his true self and that is when i will wrap up the lecture and also give the historical accounts of some of the events that led to the incident of Karbala, insha'Allah. So before I proceed, please recite aloud salawat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the holy book, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim soon we shall show we shall show them our signs in the horizons and within their selves allama taba tabai rahmatullahi alayh in his landmark work tafsir al mizan says that it is more important to know the signs within our self than knowing the signs outside ourself and the horizons why because the holy prophet peace be upon him said and this hadith is also attributed to many several imams man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabba the one who knows his true self his nafs also knows his lord the journey to knowing our lord knowing the attributes of our lord knowing about the grand scheme of things that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed starts from knowing our true self and what is that our true self it is nafs it is nafs this is the nafs that wants us to drink when we are thirsty or eat food when we are hungry or get sleep when the body needs it but also it deceives us big time it plays hide and seek with us because it has several layers when we perform actions when we do deeds we need to know what is our real motive behind that deed because that is related to the nafs if we know our nafs if we know our true self 
then we will surely know why did I do something and for whom did I do that thing because it is very possible that I recite this majlis believing that I'm doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but since I do not know my true self I do not know for whom I'm reciting this majlis in fact so I'm going to give a few examples how the nafs deceives us before I do that please recite a loud salawat when we want to do a good deed when we want to help some people when we want to support the mosque we believe that we are doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but within the layers of the nafs it is hidden the desire of getting praise from the people or to satisfy our own ego but sometimes we are not even aware of it and we keep doing those good deeds without knowing why we did that this is one example sometimes we want to help people and we genuinely believe that we do this because we love them as the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but in fact we do not love them we just pity them when you help someone out of pity that is very different from that when you help someone out of love because when you help someone out of pity you look down on that person you feel superior to that person and you also expect thanks from that person if we start to introspect and take time to know about our true self then a lot of things will be revealed to us about our self that we did not know before for example we can be envious every now and then we feel envious but we do not pay attention to it why I am envious and what is the root cause of this envy being envious means that I believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not have given this thing to that person as if I know better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is one example and there are many many things that we day every day that we do every day without thinking about them so where to start what is the process of knowing our true self where does it start it starts from silence in this world we are way too busy in our daily chores daily mundane chores and work and also on the social media and we are expected to give opinion about everything everybody wants to speak nowadays on different matters we are occupied with bigger bigger things in the outer world but we are not occupied with our inner world if we take the time to for five minutes sit quietly and think about our inner self our inner world then we will start to slowly slowly know about it 
and when we will get to know about it, initially we might reject what we get to know. It can be a scary thought to come to know that, oh, I am a liar. I sometimes lie. No one is liar in absolute terms that he lies all the time. But once you start to think about your true self and you think, oh, sometimes I lie. Sometimes I feel envy from that person, that person. Sometimes I feel arrogant. I do takabbur. Sometimes I really hate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given that thing to that person. And then you might think, no, 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 no. This is not me. I do not want to be like that. I am a Shia of Ali. How can I be like that? But at that point, just accept yourself. You do not need to be too much worried. Just accept yourself. Nowadays we hear a lot from the secular um, speakers and coaches and life coaches. Accept yourself. I'm not talking in those terms. Because they might tell you, just accept yourself the way you are. I beat up my wife, I just accept myself. No, you cannot do that. Or vice versa. In Islam, you accept yourself, you admit, I have this problem. And it is okay. No one is a liar in absolute terms. No one is a munafiq in absolute terms. It varies from situation to situation. And then you decide, I am going to work on these things. And when we start to work on these things, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the doors for us. He will open the doors of wisdom and knowledge for us. Because when you take the time, start with the silence. Silence is ibadah according to the hadith. Why? Because when you sit silent and think about your inner world, then you are pondering and reflecting and you learn a lot that many books cannot teach you. Recite aloud salawat. So that reflection, self-reflection, how it will open the doors? Do I have a, an, a hadith or an ayah or a verse to back it up? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى You get as much as you strive for, you work for. This is a general rule. General. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, it's obligatory upon you, the believers, to be concerned about your true self. Because if we do not work on those things, those attributes of ourselves, we will go away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those diseases will become a barrier between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then there is another barrier that stops us from introspection, that stops us from knowing our true self. What is that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ Do not be like those who forgot Allah, and so they forgot themselves. 
when someone does not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he or she gets lost in this world. Does not have the time to sit for one minute, two minutes every day and think about himself, his self and his relation with the Creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا Those who strive in our way, we'll show them our paths, our ways. And that striving also includes Jihadul Akbar. The greater jihad is about knowing your true self. It is so important that the Holy Prophet said, a wise person is the one who knows his true self and purifies his deeds. Purifies his deeds. Khalis. The Arabic term for it is khalis. Khalis, khulus, ikhlas. They all have the same root. Sincerity. The Holy Prophet said, the one who works on his true self, knows his true self, gets rid of those problems, the diseases of the soul, that person can make his deeds pure. Pure means they are done with sincerity. And that is the end result of our striving to know our true self. That's the end result. Can we reach there overnight? No. That sounds way too difficult. It sounds difficult. It's easier said than done. But believe me, this is the way to attain peace and tranquility. When we get to know about our true self, only then we can attain peace and tranquility. First accept how you are and then slowly, slowly start working on it. You will fail. Maybe you will still, still continue to hate that person you feel envious about. But you keep telling yourself, I'm working on myself. I'm working on myself. Remind yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of everyone. He is the master of everyone. He gives everything to everyone. He takes away everything from everyone. People cannot give anything to anyone or take away anything from anyone. That's how knowing your true self makes you know your Lord. That's how it does. And eventually, you start to do things for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take baby steps. Then you attain a state where you can have the sincere intention. Nijya. Nijya. It all boils down to Nijya. The intention. Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, says, Indeed, the intention is superior to the deed itself. But listen, the intention is the action. The intention is the deed. The Imam says, what does it mean? It means the action or a good deed without sincere intention has no meaning. It carries no weight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the holy book, فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةَ الرَّاضِيَةِ And so whose scales will be heavier on the day of judgment, he will be having a good time. He will be among the successful ones. 
how do we get the weight in our scales what is the thing that gives weight to the scales it is the intention and those who know their true self their intention is 100% pure therefore the holy prophet said ضربت علي في يوم الخندق أفضل من عبادة الثقلين. One strike by Ali on the day of Khandaq is superior to the worship by all the jinn and all the humans all together, cumulatively. Was Amir al Mu'minin doing sujood there? Was he reciting Quran there? What was the Amir al Mu'minin doing there? Just one strike? Afdalum min ibadat thaqalain? Wow. Because that was 100% pure intention only and only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happened on that day for the kids? We all know the story, but it is good to remind. It's good to talk about the Ahlul Bayt. Dhikru aliyin ibadah. When we talk about the Amirul Mu'mineen, it is worship. Why? Because he reminds us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was this battle, the battle of trenches, Khandaq. And there was a very strong man, non believer, Amr bin Abdiwud. And he came out to fight. And all the companions were scared of him. The Amir al Mu'mineen went to fight him. And he was about to behead him. And he spat on the face of the Amir al Mu'mineen. The Amir al Mu'mineen could have beheaded him right then and there. But he did not do that. He went away waited for a few minutes got back and then beheaded him later on the companions asked oh ali why did you do that the amir al mu'minin said i wanted to behead him only and only for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but when he spat on my face i feared that my Personal emotions might also mix with that intention. Amirul Mu'mineen, the Amirul Mu'mineen who is infallible, who is talking Quran, even then he is so careful, so careful. This is infallibility. Those who have perfect intellect, it is not like they are not capable of doing things that are wrong they have the capacity but since their intellect is so perfect they do not do those things pure intention that became superior to all the worship of all the jinns and all the humans all together recite aloud salawat The Ahlul Bayt are those people that no one understands them other than the Holy Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better than the Ahlul Bayt and the Holy Prophet. And these people knew their selves like no one knows their self. There is another true story about the Ahlul Bayt. We have all heard that, but it is important to remind us of that story and derive some lessons. It is said that one day, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, peace be upon them both, they fell ill. Then the Amir al Mu'mineen, Lady Fatima, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, and Fizza, they all made a nazar that we will fast for three consecutive days if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
cures Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, peace be upon them both. And they were cured. Then they fasted for three consecutive days. The first day they were about to break their fast and a destitute, a beggar, came at their door asking for the food. Whatever they had, they gave to him. The next day they fasted. At the time they were about to break their fast, an orphan came at their door and asked for the food. They gave him everything they had. The third day they fasted and then a prisoner. In those days prisoners were allowed to go from door to door and beg for food. He came at their door and asked for food. Whatever they had, they gave it to him. Okay. It was a great deed, but what about the intention? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses, a few verses to the Holy Prophet after this deed by the Ahlul Bayt. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they feed the destitute, the orphan, and the prisoner just for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they say, we feed you just for the sake of Allah and we do not even want a simple thank you from you. لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا. We do not want even a simple thank you. That is ikhlas. That is pure intention. That is someone who has known his true self. That. And they are role models for us. We cannot become like them. No one can be like them. But we can take baby steps. Baby steps every day. Spare two minutes in the evening. Spare two minutes in the evening and think about our true self and start to work. And if we fail, no problem. Keep trying again. Keep trying again. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the doors for all of us. Inshallah. Recite a loud salawat. And this and this brings me to the last part of the lecture. Those people who are willing to work on their self, they keep their minds open and they're open to advice. If someone says, I do not need any advice, I am perfect, people love me, I am good. That person has closed his mind. That person can run into serious trouble because open, because closed minds have to open up. And if they do not open up, they will suffocate. There was this man, Umar ibn Sa'd. Umar ibn Sa'd was a person who was confused. He did not know what he really wanted because he did. Please recite a salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Recite another salawat. Umar ibn Sa'd did not know what he wanted. He was in Kufa and Ibn Ziyad had given the governorship of the province of Ray to Umar ibn Sa'd. Ray was a big province in old times. It was Tehran's name, Ray. But when Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, arrived in Karbala, then Ibn Ziyad said to Umar ibn Sa'd, 
that you take 4000 soldiers and go fight Hussein Umar ibn Sa'd did not want to fight Imam Hussein he did not want to kill Imam Hussein he knew who Imam Hussein was but he also wanted the governorship of Ray so he said to Ibn Ziyad please send someone else you know you have appointed me as the governor of Ray just let me go over there Ibn Ziyad was a cunning man he said no 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 you first go fight Hussein and after that the governorship is yours so Umar ibn Sa'd went to Karbala and then he met Imam Hussein peace be upon him and he said what are your plans he had a meeting with Imam Hussein peace be upon him which was in secrecy a lot of people speculated about it what was said between the two but no one really knows what happened Umar ibn Sa'd wrote a letter after that to Ibn Ziyad and said Hussein has agreed to go back to Medina so we have three choices either we let him go back to Medina or we send him to some other province other than Kufa or Medina where he can live just like any other ordinary Muslim or we send him to Yazid and he can deal directly with Yazid Ibn Ziyad said this sounds like a reasonable advice or suggestion this is a letter from someone who is sincere to his governor so maybe I should consider it at that time Shimr was sitting there and he said what are you going to do Hussein is within our claws we have seized him if you let him go you will appear as a weak man Ibn Ziyad changed his mind and he said okay you are right take this letter take this letter to Umar ibn Sa'd and say to him demand the oath of allegiance from Hussein make him submit and surrender to me and if he refuses to do that then fight him and kill him and after you kill him trample horses on his chest because I know it is not going to hurt him after death but this is what I had sworn that I would do if he was killed and said to Shemr go there tell him he has to do it Umar ibn Sa'd has to do it and if he refuses to do that you become the commander-in-chief at that time the nafs of Umar ibn Sa'd deceived him he made the intention I will kill Hussein and later on I will repent this is how he ended up being the killer of Imam Hussein but there was another guy there was another man who was willing to listen he was open to knowing about his true self he was on a completely wrong path but he came back to the right path his name is Zuhair ibn Qayn Bajali he used to be Uthmani Uthmani were those people in a political sense who under the false propaganda of Muawiyah used to believe that the Amirul Mu'mineen either had something to do with the murder of the third Caliph Uthman or he was not sincere in avenging the blood of the third Caliph Uthman such people carried animosity for the Ahlul Bayt and it is reported that he Zuhair in fact fought against the Amirul Mu'mineen in one of the battles either Safin or Jamal however more chances that he fought in Safin against the Amirul Mu'mineen Zuhair was fighting against the Amirul Mu'mineen in Safin 
The same year, 61 Hijra, 60 Hijra, he went to perform the Hajj. And when 61st Hijra started, he was going back to his home in Kufa, taking the same road which Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, took to go to Kufa. Zuhair wanted to avoid Imam Hussein at any cost. He did not want to see Imam Hussein. He did not want to meet Imam Hussein. He did not want to hear about Imam Hussein. But the road was the same. And they had fixed points where caravans would stop to take rest and stay overnight. So he tried his best to avoid Imam Hussein. Either he would go too slow so that he would be left behind or too fast so that he would go ahead of Imam Hussein. But it so happened that on one stopping place, they both were at the same time in that spot. At that moment, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, sent a messenger to Zuhair ibn Qayyim. His companions described the situation like this. He says, we were sitting and were about to eat food that the messenger of Hussein came to us. And he said to Zuhair, Hussein is calling you. When we heard that, we were all startled. So much that it felt like there were birds sitting on our heads. Zuhair's wife said, why are you startled? Go meet Hussein and listen what he has to say. That is going to change the fortune of Zuhair. It's going to become from alayhi lahna to alayhi salam because he was open to know about his true self. Open to listen to Imam Hussein. No one knows what happened, what Imam Hussein said to him. But when he got back, his face was glowing out of enthusiasm and happiness. And he decided to join Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. What a fortunate man, Zuhair. He's a beacon of light for people like you and me. He's a beacon of light. He was an eloquent speaker. It is said that on the day of Ashura, in the morning, he went to the army of Ibn Ziyad. And he started giving them a sermon. And he said to them in that sermon, We call you to assist the family of the Holy Prophet and abandon the tyrant Ibn Ziyad. In return, the army of Ibn Ziyad started cursing him. And Shemr said to him, First he aimed an arrow at him and shouted, Shut up, your sermon has exhausted us. Zuhair replied to him, I am not addressing you. You are from the animal species. Shemr said to Zuhair, soon you and your master are going to be killed. Zuhair replied, you scare me with death? By God, I would prefer death over being in your company. Shemr said, Anyway, you and your master are going to be dead soon or we are going to take him to Ibn Ziyad in Kufa. At that moment, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, called Zuhair back. He said, Your words are going to have no effect on them. Those people had reached the point of no return. When it was the turn of Suhail to go to the battlefield, he went like a brave man. It is written in Abu Mikhnaf and some other books of Maqtal that he killed 120 men before he fell off his horse and many accursed men gathered around him. Two accursed men moved forward and killed him.
At that time, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, reached at his body and he prayed for him. May you not remain away from Allah's mercy and may your killers not see Allah's mercy. Throughout the day of Ashura, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, went on the bodies of each and every martyr. But in the end, when he was left alone and he was thirsty, and he was hungry. And Imam Zamana says, وَالشِّمْرُ جَالِسٌ عَلَىٰ صَدْرِكَ And the shimr was sitting on his blessed chest. وَلَا لَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حِسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حِسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَلَىٰ بَالنَّارِ اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته